Welcome to the Marshall Pro Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires and supported this month by Bell Racing Helmets USA. We have a fun little feature here with the next generation IndyCar stars here at the Indy 500. We sat down for a little round table at Bell's brand new, beautiful Main Street shop with Spencer Piggott from Ed Carpenter Racing, qualified within the Fast 9 for the Indy 500. Sat down with Jack Harvey with the Meyer Shank Racing Team, and also with Kyle Kaiser with Hunkos Racing. Impressive as well. Sitting across from those three young guns, we had one of the old guns, Al Unser Jr., two-time Indy 500 winner. Fun little conversation about uh, getting ready for this race. Al passing on some wisdom from his experiences at the Speedway. Some cool conversation as well about the history and lineage of Bell and not only what it means to the young drivers, but also to Al, who says he was genuinely a kid the first time he started using Bell. Some Also some tech talk in there as well uh, about turbo days and how helmets actually played a role in uh, engine performance. It might sound crazy now, but it's true. Uh, and we close, and I'm not going to preview this much other than to say... We thought we were done. I was doing my usual little throwaway nonsense, silly, whatever, haha. And the topic of ham and cheese sandwiches, Porsche 962s, and motor racing comes up. And <laughs> uh, all I can tell you is when we get to the end, uh, I'm still blown away by the awesome, awesome story that was shared with us. And it's little gems like this that occur when friends like Bell Racing Helmet say, hey, we're going to pull some folks together. Come on over. Let's do a podcast here. So, uh, yeah, great, great stuff there. You know you can get every episode of the Marshall Pro Podcast on iTunes, on Podbean, and also on our Marshall Pruitt Podcast Facebook page. And with all that said, off we go with our Bell Racing Helmets USA Roundtable at their Speedway Indiana Pro Shop. All right. Well, we have a man with a couple of faces from the uh, 500 Borg Warner Trophy. Beautiful ring there. Have you shown, uh, shown our guests what an Indy 500 winner's ring looks like. We have Al Unser Jr., Jack Harvey, Spencer Piggott, and Kyle Kaiser currently drooling over one of little Al's <laughs> Indy 500 winning rings. Yeah, that's the 94. So The beast. Yeah, yeah. It was a good day. Yeah, it was a good day. So, I bet. Yeah, yeah. So we are here today in the uh, Bell Racing Helmets Thanks. USA Thanks shop their new home here on main street the garage air conditioning overhead ambient so we're not sitting in a booth with perfect audio but you know what our lives are rarely spent in quiet booths so this is kind of perfect thought it'd be great to sit down here we have uh, ron schumann's old school helmet in front of us which weighs 47 pounds we have a replica uh, of your 1994 winning helmet which weighs nothing by comparison just thought it'd be fun to get one of the old masters here together with some of the young guns who did you give back the ring? I'm just making sure they didn't yes, back it back. Yes, yes, I they made want, sure they, <coughs> they got it back. back the ring. They want one or more. Let's start off with you, Spence, because you're someone who has been on this path in IndyCar a little longer than uh, some of the other young guns. Team did incredibly well in qualifying as a whole, making the Fast Nine. Give us some thoughts about just where you are career progression-wise. Again, at least looking across the table to someone, you're like, that's the destination. Well, that's the destination I want it. I want to go to that destination. Hopefully I get there one day. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, so far this month has been great. We've got three fast cars. Um, you know, we've shown that in qualifying trim, I think, in race trim as well. We should be competitive. And it's going to be tough, though. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of fast cars, a lot of good teams, and, um you know, it's the Indy 500, so anything can happen. It's a long race, but I'm very happy with where we are on, on the preferred freezer car. Starting six, it's by far the best uh, starting position I've had here at Indy. So, um, you know, it's going to be nice to only have a couple cars in front rather than uh, the majority of the field. You've told your boss who's on the pole, Ed Carpenter, <laughs> that you just just move over at the start uh, you're coming by? Something like that, yeah. Okay. Not, quite, not, not quite. quite those words. But. Or <laughs> there might have been a please and let me know if I can yeah. help you. Uh, so you with your Ed Carpenter <clears throat> Racing Chevy team, obviously a great day with all three cars in the Fast 9. 
move to Kyle Kaiser and the Hunkos Racing Chevy. Very unique in this field, Al, where we don't have much in the way of single car teams, mm -hmm. and we've got a team coming back for their second time with a rookie driver, two lights champions here, but three car, really strong team with, yeah. with Spencer's team, and then you've got Kyle, where you know there are some folks asking, are they even gonna be in the show? You gave them the uh, virtual middle finger and said, <laughs> we're gonna be damn far up in the show to start. Tell us just about how your month has gone and maybe you know, punching well above the weight we expected. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy month. I mean, starting off, the first week we were just focusing on qualifying because we knew we had to make the show and we struggled a little bit, to be honest. We, we weren't 100% sure going into the week what we had and literally the night before bump day, we tried something in the very last run, last session, and it made the car mile an hour faster and we were just shocked. So we're like, okay, we'll, we'll roll with that for qualifying and hopefully it's got pace and the, the Chevy engine had a lot of pace, so I was just thrilled. I saw the lap time and I couldn't believe it. I just kept it flat and said, thank God. So it was a really good feeling to see that. And I knew we were pretty comfortable at that time, but since then, I, I've just been much more relaxed, much happier. There's been great morale at the team. Everybody's having a lot of fun now, and that's what this month's all about. Amen. Jack, you've had a different experience yeah. so far this month. Uh, at least when I was a mechanic, I was I would always refer to it as the long walk to grid, yes, where uh, you, you know you're going to get in your, your steps, getting to your starting position, whereas these two friends <coughs> of yours obviously have had happier times. Tell us about the experience as a young driver trying to keep your morale up, trying to keep the team up while knowing that extra, if you could have had that extra mile an hour given it to him, he would have appreciated yeah, it. Have that you know, yeah, we need that. a little greedy there, Kaiser, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk privately. I mean, it's, it's, but tell us about when things aren't going the way you envisioned. Yeah, I think as a, as a whole, I'm listening to these two guys. I'm thinking, yeah, that sounds pretty. That sounds pretty <laughs> awesome, and exactly not what I'm dealing with right now. Whatever that change was for mile an hour, we want it. Um, it's been it's been a really challenging month, I think, for. Uh, the Maya Shank Racing Team and honestly Schmidt Peterson Motorsports, I mean, uh, the morale has not been great uh, for obvious reasons. James didn't uh, make the race. Um, you know, bump day is a, is a real thing. So when you were saying at the start of the month that, you know, you don't really know what you've got, I mean, that stresses to everybody. Yeah. Um, I mean, I honestly, I didn't think we would be that much on the bubble. Uh, and I saw my first lap and, and like he was like, that's what. Well, you were happy with your speed, and I looked at it and thought, really? That's all we've got? Um, and it was, it's, it's been, I, think I can't remember the race has been pretty good, honestly. I think I've been pretty happy race winning wise, but in terms of qualifying, I can't complain with the balance of the car. Balance is, balance is good, we just, we just don't, we just didn't have it, honestly. Um, I think what happened to James, the knock on effect of that has rubbed, you know, to every nook and cranny of the team. Um, I think ultimately we had a you know a big team meeting. It was a case of okay, well we've still got three cars on the show. Let's try and let's try and end the month on a, as positive note as possible. And I mean we are optimistic with our race car, but we certainly made it a little bit harder work than we would have hoped. So starting thirty first. So. so Al, we started out speaking about your greatest days at Indy, defending Indy five hundred winner. You come back in nineteen ninety five. It's going to be a breeze, right? pick up another ring, right? <laughs> get the trophy ready, get that mug ready to go. You know, so listening to these guys, you I mean, you had all of their experiences together. What can you tell someone like Jack, who fortunately you're in the race, but uh, you know, you're gonna have a long way to go. What do you have to say to someone like Jack when you know what it's like to go from the highest to the lowest of lows? Yeah, I was just thinking about that as, as I was listening to everybody, you know, I. I uh, won the race in 94, came back in 95, and missed the show. So it was from one extreme to the other. And, and honestly, at, at Penske Racing, it, we were in disbelief, you know, in 95. I mean, uh, you know, you never you never come to Indy and think that you're going to drink the milk and it's just going to be a breeze. Ooh. Okay, Marshall, yeah. so that never, <laughs> ever happens. But, <laughs> We never thought that we would not be racing the Indy 500, and, and so when that happened, it was uh, it was devastating. But uh, you know, for all the years that that I have run Indy, you know, no matter where you're starting, it's the finish that's important. And so 
for each one of you. I mean, it's, it's taking care of your equipment, especially at the start, you know, the, the first few laps. I mean, uh, you got a whole race in front of you, and so, you know, there's going to be uh, huge temptations to go up there and, and stick it in, and, and especially starting 31st, which I started in the back quite a few times. Those, those holes open, what we call, you know, the, the opportunity shows up, and it's only for one or two cars, and you're in the back like that, and, and at the beginning of the race, you have to be careful not to go up in there because it closes just as fast as it opens. And so, um, you know, just to, to get the, the, the race started and get it going. And, you know, um, I remember my dad won in 87 and he started in the back uh, with me. And, but there was an accident in turn one. <clears throat> Fortunately, it was just behind me, but it was in front of my dad. And, uh, and you know, he admits that he took it too easy at the beginning of the race and he got a lap down almost right away and, and, and he had to fight hard to get that back and that sort of thing and but he ends up winning the race and so uh, you just never know which way this thing's going to go you never know who's going to be running at the end and who's not going to be running at the end and so you know this is this is a place that uh, that patience 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 is the key to this whole thing and, and uh, you know, and, and just uh, try and invest and, and doing it and, uh, and hopefully you're around at the end. And if you are, each one of you has an equal shot as Ed Carpenter, as all the Penske cars, you know, everybody's starting up front. You all have an equal opportunity to, to win this thing. Let's talk about another topic before we get into a little bit of the shared Bell Helmet uh, histories with everyone here. We're expecting things to be warm at minimum on Sunday, if not sweaty, falls hot. Mm -hmm. You and the oh, other just go ahead and okay. say it's you on the other hand, you've well you've experienced that, Al, but you've also experienced a crazy day like ninety two where it was far colder than expected. The end result was about the same though, whether it was a byproduct of heat or not enough heat, cars that just were moving beneath you the whole time, not planted. This crazy guy again, of course, wins the Indy 500 in those circumstances as well. Tell us a little bit about going into a race where you know you're not going to be glued and happy and planted and you're going to have to spend a couple hours of your life holding on to a beast that either wants to get out from under you or get into the wall because I fear this might be their reality come, and everyone's reality come Sunday. What's the mindset you need to deal with that? Well, just to, the mindset is simple, just just drive what the car is going to allow you to do, you know, I mean, it's that simple. No heroics? Mindset. No, you, you start doing heroics and you'll be out of the race like as quick as you, you, you're in it, I mean, it's, it's that fast and so um, I think these guys have a unique challenge, me working with Harding Racing and working with Gabby, you know, we've run max downforce and we want more, okay? I think everyone would raise but, their hand on that but one. We're max. I mean, we're and so when I was racing, there there was no limit that you know we could put a bunch of downforce in the car, a bunch, you know, where where it would be glued no matter how hot it was, but you'd be super slow down the straightaway. So. Except for 94 when you had more than a thousand horsepower, but that was an exception. <laughs> but yeah, I've ever yeah, that, that, that was an anomaly. Yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was a real. Uh, but in today's car, I mean, we're running max and, and we wanted more. And so, um, like for example, uh, a wicker bill on the rear wing is not allowed. Yep. You know, and, and you can only have so big and so long of wickers on the front wings. and, and, and so. Uh, you can't go above that, and, and for a, for an 85 to 90 degree day, out, out on on Sunday was what they were predicting. Man, I wished I had more grip, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and these guys are going to want, they're, they're going to wish they had it. So, so you know, they're just going to have to be able to drive what the car is going to allow them to do. 
and, and that's going to be the key. Spence, let's talk about that. Uh, Monday, obviously, we had a couple hours uh, of race simulation, some pretty good trains going on there. We'll get an hour's look tomorrow on carb day, but how close were you able to get into that comfort zone? Were you reminded after, like, God, I got fast hands, because otherwise, you know, this thing would be in a bundle. What did you find? Yeah, definitely, you know, throughout a run, it can go from understeering sometime to oversteering in certain corners, and there's not really a great, you know, you can't really predict it sometimes. It's you know, not something. telegraphing yeah, what's coming. Yeah, exactly. You can't just bank on it always doing one thing throughout the run. So I think you have to, you know, just take, like Al said, take what it gives you, but also don't get too freaked out. If you do have a little snap or little moment, you know, you can't let that kind of knock down your confidence because it's going to happen mm. throughout the race. And hopefully it's not so <coughs> big, but, you know, you're going to have to be able to, to drive the car in, in both situations. And for us, we had... I think a few good runs, uh, a few not so good runs. It seems to be very easy to kind of tip it over one way or the other. So, um, you know, it's going to be a fine line of really getting the car just in the right window. I think, um, you know, throughout the race, you have the little things you can change about with the front wing, um, but you know, the rear wing, like Al said, it's probably going to be maxed out for everyone the whole time. And just trying to tune it in throughout the race, you've got a few tools in the car, but. Um, you know, you want to make sure you start the race with the car in a good window because if you're out of the window, you know, it might not be able to get back in it. Jack, let's continue that thread with your Meyer Shank Racing Honda. So to the average fan watching, they're not going to see you doing big Tokyo drifts through the corners and oh, going, oh, yeah. now I get what he's talking about, if right? If he does, it'll be a one and done. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. if they do, you'll be on Sports Center and we'll be no, seeing no, you in the infield. Danny Sullivan in 85. Right, well, yeah. we'll see if we can get the old man back in the car. I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's fair no enough. No one wants to do no. that. Okay. I'm certainly happy letting somebody else do that heroic yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But speak, speak, Jack, to the fact that, again, although this isn't something huge and demonstrative that fans can see whether they have binoculars or they have super high speed eyeballs or they can do things in slow speed tell us about what you are having to do in the car in the average lap to keep it pointed in the direction you want uh, I think first off it, you know, it depends on your balance for sure if, you, if you've got understeer typically you see someone turn the wheel more I mean it sounds goofy to say but literally is that simple you just turn more but that's something um, for fans to watch if they get an in-car camera shot yeah. usually from the uh, right side mirror just one of those things if you want to get a feel sure you know you don't have to be a race car driver to, to know what it's like but if you see a driver's hand starting to get higher on that shot you know that they're dealing with understeer. You no, know, I think the thing that's interesting is when your car is what we would call free actually your hands almost like barely turn the wheel and that's probably when you're looking at someone in the most vulnerable state because you know if you if you quicken the speed in which you do that turn, you can end up in a whole world of trouble. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw James Davidson's crash in turn two, but like by the time you've realised that you've got that free, you're already spinning. Yeah, yeah. You know, like the time in which you think you've got an issue, and then you know you've got an issue, you're already stopped pretty much because you've already hit the wall, and then your car's come to a complete stop. And I think it's a it's just a real interesting thing where if you're watching from an onboard camera, typically it's safer when you're seeing somebody adding in a bunch of wheel. When they're barely turning the wheel, they're so free, they don't want to turn the wheel yeah. anymore. And if the, the time, right hand is up, somewhat safety somewhat zone, safe. when, straight or the left hand's up, oh, start your prayers. It's all gone wrong, wrong, mate. And honestly, it is the time in which it goes wrong is the blink of an eye. Because you're watching James earlier, and you're like, okay, you know, it looks good for him. One, no, like, initial, no, no big issue. Gets to two, turns in, and then just, and he's gone. He like he was barely turning the wheel. I mean, it's it's not a. The people who are not turning the wheel. They're the ones who are stressing out. I think as much as the people who are doing it. Ooh. Kyle, let's close on this thread. When it comes to working with your team, so as Al said, and I think as everyone has agreed, please give us 500 more pounds of downforce something, but it's not there to get. How do you game plan with your team, with your engineer, going into the race to say, okay, if things are going slightly awry, what are my options to at least get me to a place of comfort? Yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have somebody with as much experience as Tom has, Tom Brown, because there's been moments where we don't know what's going on and we had to really go back and go back to the uh, drawing board and figure, mm. figure stuff out. But 
like Al said, patience, not just in reference to the race, but setting up this car. Because if we get go down a wrong path and we get frustrated, you might not be able to get out of that hole. So we, we were patient, we waited, we, tr we kept trying stuff, and we just were persistent. And I think that persistence, eventually we found the right answer. There was no guarantee we were going to find it. You can see there are plenty of really strong teams that couldn't find the answer because yeah. this new car has made it so difficult. But just we, we, we made a right decision and it worked out, but we were persistent. You have a heck of a history with this company. Let's talk about finding the right helmet for that glorious head of yours. I know. Um, <laughs> The, the, the tale is it took a little while to find a place of happiness and exactly what was right, but I always think it's cool, and obviously we're here courtesy of our friends at Bell Racing Helmets, but I just always find it a pretty cool thing when you have a driver who's had a long-term association with the brand. It doesn't mean necessarily things are perfect your first trial. What's it been like coming into the Bell family and finding that? I don't comfort? know where you heard that, Marshall. I mean, uh, once I put the Bell on, I, it was... It was like home. I mean, I. The fact I that our started, friends from Bell are laughing right now I, is perfectly fine. I, I started. Okay, Chris was. I was before him, okay? I had a Bell helmet in my go kart when I was 9, 10, 11 wow. years old. Okay, so um, I've been a Bell guy for a very, very long time before Chris. I didn't Who's think like there was a before Chris. Like, like, <laughs> he's like 140 years old. So, um, but let's no, talk about I mean, the weight was, of that was, first of all. That's the thing I want to know. I'm guessing at, it was pretty heavy. Yeah, it was pretty heavy. You and, built your neck and, muscles uh, early back then. Well, that in the sprint car, you know, it, it uh, you had to, you had to. It was just, a, it was just the times and yeah. so on. I mean, you know. In that day, Bell made the lightest helmet that, that existed, and, and, and today they do the same thing. And, and so uh, they've always led in the technology, no matter what era you're in. And, uh, you know, uh, Bell has always been, uh, have given me the, the, the ultimate in, in head safety and, and that sort of thing that, that can be available. And so, uh, and on top of that, they're comfortable, you know? I mean, uh, if anything, I have a little bit of a weird-shaped forehead, okay? And oh, so, I live a misshapen and, life, Al, so, so you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir so here. so when I would put on, you know, my, my, my bell, it was the, the only thing, some of them were a little bit tight on the forehead, and so I would have to have them stand out the forehead a little bit, and, and, uh, and really that was about it. I mean, we... We did a lot of things. We we developed uh, uh, the the little the little cover that goes underneath my chin. Yeah. Because uh, I caught fire in Cleveland one day, in in the pits, and uh, and the fire came up through through underneath the helmet because the fuel it was a fueling mishap and the fuel spilt over on my lap and in my chest and then when it light lit it lit up down here and the flame came up. And it burned my nose a little bit, you know, nothing, nothing big at all. Uh, nothing big. My uh, face was on was fire. <laughs> <laughs> nothing big. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. I don't have any scars or nothing. Come on. And so, That's what I meant. So, uh, the generous, truer statement was just that. Fire in my helmet, but it wasn't big. <laughs> well, it wasn't. It wasn't. As a matter of fact, I get out of the car, and actually my left front, Ziggy, okay, <laughs> was my left front, Paul Harkis. He was, and, and he got burned, and he got burned pretty good and he got burned in his gnats. Okay. Oh. I, mean, it was, I was going to say, he, he's good. so ugly we yeah, couldn't tell. It was but, okay. not good. Okay. So, wow. so anyway, the fire happened right at the beginning of the stop and so buckets of water came on, everybody's put out, every, you know, I was leading the race when I came in the pits to make the pit stop and so now the fire's out, everything's good and I'm looking and I'm looking in my car and it's perfectly fine. So Rick Gallus is my car owner. I said, Rick, let's go. Let's get back in the race. And he goes, ah. he goes, half your crew is burned. Oh, jeez. <laughs> we could get you back out there, but we can't make any stops. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to change it's all your that. tires, too? <laughs> That's Lord. what Rick told me. And I go, okay, well, I guess we're, we're out of the race. But, <laughs> wow. But, uh, no, so we developed that, that, that uh, little, little fabric that goes underneath the chin. And, and when we did that, 
we discovered that you could hear, they could hear me on radio communications better. Yeah. So it was a, like a double whammy. And, and so, uh, you know, we've done some other things with the bell when, when uh, I put in there that, that uh, we had an extra fabric to go across my nose, okay, across the top, so that when it rained, I could put that fabric in there with a little nose piece that, that would pin it down and then it'd keep my breath and, and avoid it from fogging the fogging by quite a lot so uh, you know there's been a lot of innovations that 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 I was a part of with Bell but uh, I've told you before you know, just as a sidebar your Bell during your Valvoline years just that helmet livery itself is one of the most beautiful things yeah I've it is I, as a matter of fact I, I keep it today I use it today and, and uh, you know for myself I never had a specific design of <coughs> the helmet that would separate me from the race car. I always felt that uh, that the helmet should match the race car in, in every aspect because I figured they know who's driving, you know. I and mean, if not, you, know, you need to go faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Make exactly, sure they know. Exactly, that's right. So, so, you know, where you'd see the helmet that's sitting in front of you, it has the, the Marlboro Chevron yeah. on it. Now, Rick Mears drove this pattern, that this paint scheme. My father drove that paint scheme, and so um, I didn't really care, you know. And the the the, the Valvoline helmet, it, it, delivery on it, it was to match the car, you know. And I I had a black helmet when I was in the the Coors Light black car. Didn't you have a cue ball you know, in uh, in your uh, your eagle early on there too? I did. It was pure white yep. with uh, with Gallus across the front. He really liked that. He was the car owner, and so he, <laughs> got he my loved that being helmet. up there. And so, yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I, I felt that uh, that it should it should match the car always. So let's talk about one more piece, retro piece, before we talk to these guys about their preferences. So your replica '94 helmet doesn't have. The, this uh, one right here doesn't, yeah, doesn't have, have the little uh, wastegate <laughs> that you're listening to. Listen, Talk listen about to. that. These guys race twin turbo V6 engines from Chevy and Honda, but they don't have pop-off valves. Yeah. You, on the other hand, did. Tell us about what this little helmet attachment did and why you would want it in the first place. Well, in today's car, they're, they're totally controlled electronically. Yep. You know, and, and so when we start talking about the pop-off valve, this is before electronics came into it, so I actually had a knob on in the car that I could turn the boost up and down with mechanically, okay, and so in order to... These guys I can see are going you know, back and asking for that today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Home the gun yeah. So there was a limit, you know, and, and it was the pop-off valve, and it was it was a valve, little round valve that sat on top of the plenum, and as soon as we got so much boost in it, it would pop and the air would <coughs> So they had a, a little tube connected to it on the, when it would pop up and it would blow the air. It would I'd come all the way through up, up the cockpit and into my helmet and it would blow air no on my cheek. Oh my God. And it was hot. It was hot air. Okay, and so now would you get any audio little pitch difference that it was about to blow or no, or no, you could just feel it. You could it kind of go. Like that. So that was a way of regulating boost limits. Since so, there was no electronic so means, they would say that this was a maximum amount. Right, and right, since you right. could, through a cockpit knob or just the engine tuner being really aggressive, try and put a trillion pounds of boost through, well, there was a limit. So the only way to regulate that was mechanically through, again, sitting on top of the turbo plenum, this tall kind of looked like a really big beer can with a spring inside of it. And once the turbo <coughs> pressure exceeded that spring's limit, that spring would compress a little bit, the air would leak out, and you'd go from having 800 horsepower to nothing. Or, you know, if you let it go all the way, but that was that was the listening device to get a feel for... Turn it back down a little bit and so yeah, you didn't you'd, get... You'd close it. Yeah. yeah, you'd find out where the limit is, and then, and then you'd make sure it awesome. stayed closed. So, How much did you have to adjust that? Was it a constant thing? Throughout? No, oh. no. Once you had it set, once everything warmed up, you know, at the beginning of the race, it was a little bit difficult because uh, the turbo produces more boost when it's hot. Okay, so when you first start the race and it's a cold turbo, then you would turn it up yeah. at the start of the race and then 
you know, down the back stretch, it's it's popping and you're turning it back down and stuff like that. And so, along with all the cars around you and stuff like that. And so, but it, it, it was the driver fully on controlled how much boost was in his car because the valve, it, it wasn't electronic. And, and so even in our, when telemetry came into our race cars, they couldn't, the pits couldn't do anything about it, okay? Even if they did see the boost, telemetry wise they couldn't do anything it was the driver that controlled the whole thing and so you just turn it right back down and and, uh, and run your race once everything got warmed up it, it was pretty much set right? and the other fun thing too is those pop-off valves belong to the series so you might figure out get a feeling for how one is working for you in the third race of the year but you're gonna have a different one for the fourth and everyone's arguing about, oh, mine's popping too early, and there's always back and forth. Constant. So, uh, the, I mean, even, just... Even when my valve was a good valve, it was not a good valve. <laughs> okay? So you had to take, take it back and go, look, you need to make this a little stronger. And so you never had the same valve more than twice. You did start the weekend with a valve and pretty much end with it, but during the month of May... Um, you would switch out several valves during practice and so on because they're humanly equal, okay? Yeah. Humanly possible equal. And when you get out there and you start running, there were differences. And that, <coughs> that truly was the flaw of the whole system is, is that, yeah, there's guys that would get better valves on one day and those valves would go away and you'd come and you man, I got a good valve, and you go run the next day, and you, the thing pops early, and, and you've got the same valve. And so you go, what the hell's going on? And you take it back, and they go, oh, well, we need to do adjust it a little bit, because it was a little too good. Jeez. Okay, and you go, okay, well, now it's really bad, so, you know, it's a constant battle, all, every day, during the day, the guys, whenever the car wasn't running, the valve was taken back to USAC and, and said, we need a stronger valve. It was a constant situation. So you know how much we talk about hating balance of performance in sports cars and yeah. those engineers and team owners are always going to the tech shit and say, you're, you're screwed. Well, this was IndyCar's version in the, in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. So you guys are familiar with, when you put on your, your race suits, you have the cables and such already kind of wired in to connect to the car that then connects to your helmet. What do you think about your helmet also being connected to something in the back of the car as well that you're having to listen to and being in, you have to be your own data monitor. So you're turning and working all your controls, but you also kind of have one ear on what's going on. Is that, does that sound a little crazy or give you even more appreciation <coughs> for some of the, uh, the old guard here? Marshall, it was easy. Okay. Come on, I'm trying to build them up, damn it. <laughs> that thing popped, well, you knew it, you knew it. So it was the air, it. not so much it's the, the air, noise, you just feel the like, right. I could see you like, yeah. you know, being so caught up in the moment that you might not even feel it, or, I don't know. It, it depends pop. how hard or how, yeah. Because sometimes I don't even pop. hear the guys, you know, I never have heard anyone in my whole career call the green flag. I know they do it, <laughs> but... I never hear it. I'm going way before that anyway, and I'm already trying to pass people or defend. And so, Wheeler, are you going to coach up a spotter and talk a little bit? Right there, nice. All right, all right. What about you, Jack? I mean, just the fact that you are having to do more than just be an athlete, but you're also having to at least keep an eye because it wasn't just the fact that you get the burst there, but you also know as you're pulling revs and building boost. So you're getting, you know, somewhere towards the top of the rev range, that's more likely when something would come in. But just the thought of you're having to actively monitor your situation so you don't lose a ton of horsepower. Well, I think the fact that it would essentially, I guess, like, burn you in like, some way. Yeah. You know, it was like heat on your face. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of things right now, you know, we don't have anything like that. It's not like we have something connected to the wheel where if you're having too much lock, it shocks you, you know. <laughs> Good idea. I, you know, and that, but that's the thing. I'm going to call Jay Fry. Hold on just a second. There you go. I mean, they're literally having something that basically, when it's getting to the edge, is like getting through. So yeah. you're talking about something I mean, right now. I mean, we have we have our bars, we have our weight jack here, we have someone talking on the radio, and then you've got your spotters telling you, like, you know, what's going around, and then you're just trying to focus on your race, and suddenly something's blowing at you. The motor's it's, mad at you. Yeah, the motor's not happy with you. And I, I, I guess it's just a. Um, I just think it's like 
really cool that people did that and mm-hmm. it's like it just here as a yeah, legend yeah. having like probably like one sheet that's like a slightly <laughs> darker shade maybe because it's like been burnt for so many years but I just love that just, they integrated this into hel- you know into yeah. the helmets as well yeah. so Jack it, it was it was you know I just kind of reminded here that that you know, we would be able to control our boost, turn the knob sure. up and down, okay? We would turn it down for fuel mileage, sure. okay? With you guys, it's a knob on, the, on your steering wheel and it's done with fuel yeah. and timing instead of boost. Sure. And, so, and, and boost, but it's done with a switch. So we're doing the same thing yeah. out there, we're just doing it differently. So, you know, the formula that these guys <coughs> today is just different from the formula that, that I used to race and my formula was a little bit different from my sure. dad's era okay and so but it's still just as hard the fundamentals of, of winning the 500 are the same it's, uh, and so it's just different it okay. sounded super cool until you said it was easy mm-hmm. and I think we were all just a little disappointed because it <laughs> sounded so cool damn it out <laughs> Jack, let's stay with you and talk about generations. Uh, you had your beautiful Indy 500 helmet unveiling here, gorgeous airbrush art and such, <laughs> matches your car and whatnot. And just before that, you were doing your best to stuff Ron Schumann's helmet <laughs> yeah. on your head. Yeah, so, so let's just talk about this, guys. You obviously have a lot of personalization that you do. You know you can come in here at the, the Main Street shop and get taken care of any time. But... Tell me about nice. this beautiful thing here in front of you, Jack, and then trying on something that is smaller yeah. but heavier in Ron's helmet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good Lord. Uh, this is one thing where you're definitely thankful to be a race car driver in 2018. For sure. Um, I think that's one of the things I think people talk about has changed the most, and it's helmet safety. Um, that, Spencer's petting your helmet, by the way, fine. but that's okay. Yeah, I was like, he's, he's fine. You can keep it maybe. Um, <laughs> I tried it on, and honestly, it was like tight on my head. But there's no, there's no like flex in that thing. You know, it is it is rigid, and it is hard, and it is heavy. And I actually, thought as soon as I tried it on, my God, your like neck strength must have just been incredible back in these days. Because I mean, like the the weight of this now versus like that is incredible. Um, I know you you've mentioned it. I mean, you, there's nothing to add really about how good a job. Bell are doing because they are, you know, industry leaders in what they're doing. I, they, I guess when I look at that, it would have been kind of like a maybe a one size fits all. Where now, I mean, we can get like extra cheap padding, we can get extra stuff on our forehead, on the back of the head, and you know, what fits me might not fit Spencer or Kai or you know, I don't know if you wanted to try it. And you know, there's different size shells, and it just seems like so many things are a little bit more customizable to keep you comfy where that's what that's what we're used to and you know even when my dad raced and he did some uh, sprint car racing I try and like this helmet should be like you wore this like it's like it's not comfy and he's like that's what we have it was it literally you know, was, never it was, thought about it, was, it. It, was, it was that simple it was like well if you wanted to go racing you, you that's like you you had your different brands and you chose your brand and you just hoped you went with honestly back I guess he said to me, you went with the people who just naturally fit your head better, you know. I mean, I think that still happens now, but I feel like everybody can, you know, cut a bit out here or add a bit in padding-wise that, that fits you. But I, I, I just look at that now and I just think that the first thing that comes to mind is the size of people's necks back in the day. They must oh, yeah. Have been, like, huge. You didn't get in fights with most drivers back no, then. No, because they were just real men. Yeah, and here we have further proof of helmet safety, Salt Walther's uh, road-tested 1973 (laughs) helmet. Fortunately, I don't think the three of you have a helmet that looks anything (coughs) like this after a crash, but, I mean, not trying to overstate the obvious, but if you had no idea who Salt Walther was, but knew that he was in in the Indy 500 and this was his helmet, this helmet tells the tale of how his date went. Yeah. Um, Not very good. Yes. This was one of the more, either that or one of the craziest liveries to start the race I've ever come across before. It's a little scratched up. It's not secondhand, it's fifth hand. That's, 
I got the, I mean, like in the, in the nicest way, seeing how helmets have developed now made me feel so much more comfortable mm. with like what we're having to like deal with. Uh, because I look at back there and I do think it's when, you know, I say men were men, but people were just outright brave. You know, I, you know, I look at it now and go, okay, going to 20, you know, plus I think everybody looks at it, everybody has an element of bravery. But that's real, you know, that was a very real scenario that somebody could get in. Um, you know, in a time when motorsport wasn't as safe, was as dangerous, which wasn't as safe. So seeing what we get to deal with now, and not necessarily just because of the, uh, the glitter and the sparkles on the helmet, but just knowing how safe they are, I think it's, uh, I think it's peace of mind, <clears throat> for me anyway. I will say my mum. There's a lot of pink and a lot of sparkles on this helmet. Yes, yeah, yes. For, uh, yes. <laughs> it matches the car, yeah, matches the car I thought Danica was <laughs> referred to as Princess Sparkle Pony, but <laughs> she is retiring. I might have a successor oh, here. You said that. that uh, really, I, what I see when I look at, at your helmet is, is the additional material that's on here, the, the visor guard here, the extra screws and so on, and it's still lighter than the helmet oh, I was yeah. had on here a little bit ago. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is crazy. The technology is, is just advancing yeah, they, more and more, and that was right on top of it. The so, team actually wanted me to have <laughs> the longer uh, chin panel because it helps them hear me better on the radio. And honestly, it's just one of those things that we've added, not really knowing where it came from. So yeah. seriously, thank you. And I'm sure my whole team will thank you for it too because they say that I'm not easy. But I'm just <laughs> amazed the team actually wants to hear them out. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the yeah, most yeah, surprising part of all this. Well, let's close with uh, Spence and Kyle talking about what I think could be a cool story. So Al told us his introduction to Bell was at eight or nine years old in karting and now at a svelte 35 years old, you know, he's still Thank a proponent. <laughs> what about you guys who've been, you know, perfect examples of the Mazda Road to Indy come up through uh, the American open wheel scene and you've been building your own legacy with the brand. I'm guessing you look to someone like Al and go, that's a pretty cool, essentially lifelong association. <coughs> These things you're, you're forecasting for yourselves as well? Yeah, I, sh I sure hope so. Um, yeah, my first ever karting helmet was a Bell as well when I was, uh, yeah, I got it when I was seven. Wow. A, a white oh, Bell, my. and we had, um, I had a Michael Schumacher replica visor strip on oh, it. Oh, oh, yeah. nice. And uh, the Tic Tac and the Marlboro and the <laughs> Shell. The so, Marlboro at seven years yeah, old. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to talk to your dad when we're done here, but okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just. I, went away a little bit but now I, I started wearing Bell again last season and it's been you know a great experience I've really enjoyed the helmet you know as soon as I put it on it's extremely comfortable light was one of the first things I noticed as well and you know the service that we get from from everyone at Bell you know we get whatever we need it it's always prepped it's always ready for us so it's it's nice to be at the track and not have to worry about putting tariffs on or a new visor if it's raining you know as soon as I go in the truck it's already done so that's that's really neat and um, you know they're putting a lot of effort and resources into places like this here in Speedway, so it's um, you know it's great to see the the company you know kind of growing and, and being more um, in in my life, which I'm very happy about. So Kyle, I was I joked on a podcast earlier this week that one of the new services they're providing is Helmet Sense, so you can get vanilla, root beer, whatever you want, lavender. Kyle wants cotton candy. Yeah, so that that a that might be a thing, but. Tell me about having your helmet here getting ready for the 500 and coming in and saying, all right, guys, these are the things that I'd like. Often in the past, that was something left either to the team or the driver. Is there a level of comfort knowing that, again, with the relationship you're building here, it's almost, you know, whatever you need made to order ASAP? It's, it's been an amazing experience, and I'm probably the newest guy to the Bell family. This is my first year with them, and it's been so amazing. They've been so helpful. And Give me whatever I need, whenever I need it. it I, I couldn't be more grateful for what they've done. And like Jack said, with the, you know, the little chin pad or the chin piece. I mean, my team was struggling to hear me and to hear the origin story of how that came about. It's been really cool. I just had to go in and say, yeah, I need a longer one. They're like, done, boom, swapped it out in a minute. So it's been really amazing. Give me whatever visors I want to match my new liveries and my helmet because I've gotten a couple different helmet liveries now. So it, it's just been an amazing experience since I've been with them. Having them right there at the track in the garage. Every day I come out and I'm like, 
where's my helmet? I'm like, oh, it's probably at Bell. I go over there and they're working on it and they got it ready to go for the next day. So I've just been completely surprised and in a good way at how hard they work. And knowing they have most of the drivers in the field, it's not like they have just my helmet to work on. They're working on a lot of helmets. 19. And it's yeah. just an incredible effort. I'm very happy to be with them. All right, last question then. If you could have had scented helmets, what would you want it to smell like, Al? What are we thinking? Are you kidding? <laughs> You'd want beef, uh, wouldn't you? You'd want steak scented, no. steak no. and Marlboro scented no. helmets. My no. helmets were scented and it wasn't fresh. <laughs> oh, all, right. all right, Harvey, what about you? Come on. What? Uh, uh, we've already got Sparkle Pony covered, so I mean, there's no way further down. I don't, I don't know what the queen smells like. I just wanted to radiate the queen. Oh, man. There you go. That's weird. That is. <laughs> there you go. An elderly I'm woman. Month. An elderly woman. I uh, just it just radiates so. home. <laughs> Spence, what, what what what's coming? What are we smelling in your helmet? Oh, if if know. Wheeler could bust that out. How about roses? Oh, oh you have the nose. Nice flowers. Now oh, there's hope. There's some. There's some, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some, there's some media. There's a media <laughs> training <laughs> opportunity here. I was thinking vodka, but. <laughs> Swing and a miss, Spencer Piggott. Uh, did we figure out what, what yes, yours would be there, Kyle <laughs> I do have a sweet tooth for cotton candy, and Spencer <laughs> did say that. I've always kind of liked the smell of fuel. I know that's weird, and it's probably a bad one to have in the helmet when you're driving. What yeah, kind of fuel? Because are we talking fuel. diesel? No, or are no. we Just racing on, fuel. I, like, like at the go-kart track, you just smell the, you smell the fuel. It's kind of a cool, like... High yeah. If it's one yeah. thing we've learned today, is that is the new definition of manly and cool. Mm -hmm. I heard Rose. Well, I was going to say, step this up, right? I'll tell the story of the helmet being in fire in the helmet. You want fuel in the helmet. I don't know if we learned anything here, my friend, but you know, we got time. They're young. You're talking about sense, okay? That reminds me Daytona 24 oh, hours. Here we go. <laughs> 6 a.m. in the morning. Foyt puts me in the car because it was a rush deal. I didn't get anything to eat. Porsche 962. Yep, Porsche 962. And so. Uh, we're two hours stand, so one hour, and they come in for fuel, and another hour. Came in for fuel right before the stop. Do you need anything? Go, I'm hungry. I'm <laughs> hungry. And so on my stop, they slide in on a pole, take to a pole. They slide in a ham and cheese sandwich, okay, with mustard. And, and they did it as a joke, okay. Well, they pulled the pole back, no sandwich. <laughs> so I'm out there running. I took my gloves off. No oh my God. God. Put them, put them under, under oh, my shit. legs. Started getting into this sandwich, okay? And then, <coughs> boy, I had to pull my helmet down. Well, that didn't work. So I pull it up, and, oh. and, and, and I'm driving, okay? And, <laughs> and, uh, and Foyt hears about what I'm doing, and he goes, I didn't pay you. He comes on the radio, I didn't pay you. To, to eat, I paid you to drive, and and, uh, and I go, well, what lap time do you want? You know, because I'm I'm hitting the number yeah. that they want, and so the crew, how Foyt found out about it, is the crew's talking on the radio. Where'd the sandwich go? I said, I got it. <laughs> what are you doing with it? I said, I'm eating it. <laughs> and so for the rest of the race, okay, because mustard got everywhere. Oh. For the rest of the race, oh, that 962 smelled like mustard. Yeah. That was awful. I mean, I'm assuming you'd have been heel and toe in the H pattern. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not like we have now, just up and down on the steering wheel. Yeah, I mean, no, that's, no. It was, that's it was heel and that's down. Real Mowing mustard. down a yeah, ham yeah. sandwich. In a Porsche 962 yeah. in the high got, banks of Daytona. Yeah. A lot less yeah. a year after and this, the I ate the whole in. thing. And too. he ate the I whole thing. I the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> Took awesome. me about six laps or so. <laughs> All right. Well, we got to let wow. these guys go. All I'm saying is, we hopefully Gabby won't hear this, but if you get a chance on race day, stick out. You know, get that no, drink no, bottle no, going with time. a little sandwich taped in there. This, this is a Daytona 24. Hours. Okay. Hey, this ain't. This is Indy. 500 miles. He's focused as we, you guys are. We should do it just as an inside joke, and then we'll all laugh about it. But no one else will know what's going on. <laughs> Gabby, if you're wondering where the ham and cheese sandwich came from, it wasn't us. <laughs>